Hello everyone and welcome to this second lecture in which I will be reviewing adaptations to fasting, in particular looking at morphological and physiological changes associated with this. And first of all we need to revise a little bit of or relevant aspects of gast gastrointestinal or intestinal morphology. To understand the topic of intestinal remodeling. In particular, now we are going to be I'm going to be talking about mammals. But this is a very cartoon-like picture of what the microstructure of the gastrointestinal or the lining of the intestine looks like. And in this lining, basically, you, the, the formation of villi that increase the su surface for reabsorption of nutrients in the intestine is an important element. Obviously, what the figures on the side, on the right-hand side, are showing you is how would it look like in cross-section. If you have cross-section of the villi, which we basically will be, will be looking around and around, and further down, if you do a cross-section further down, through what's called the crypts, the crypts of Leverkuhn, you would see this type of picture. Essentially, in this type of tissue, cell proliferation occurs consistently, continuously, in these scripts. The scripts of Leverkuhn are the places where the stem cells of the enterocytes, where the stem cells that will yield or will produce new epithelial cells are located. These cells will be formed by mitosis here and will migrate slowly along the surface of the intestinal villi all the way to the actual tip of it. And be, it's up there that they will be degraded and die. When they reach the tip of the villus, these enterocytes become apoptotic, as every cell in the body, it has a certain lifetime, and then they will die up there. They are there, the, the remains of these cells are shed off into the lumen of the intestine. Therefore, the expectation here is a system in which the formation of new cells, cell proliferation happening down here, is balanced by the death of cells on the tip. There is a balance here, and that's what maintains the epithelium, the gastrointestinal, the intestinal epithelium, intact and functional. In general, the, uh, this cell proliferation is related to the activity of the gut. The higher the activity, the higher the proliferation rates in this tissue. Where am I going with this? The activity of the tissue, cell remodeling, cell apoptosis, is related to activity. This means that there is a plasticity in this gastrointestinal tract, in the renovation and its remodeling. This is also, importantly, a clinical problem. A clinical problem related, for example, with parenteral feeding. Parenteral feeding is associated with administration of nutrients via the, um, via the, the circulation through a vein, therefore bypassing the gastrointestinal system. In a parenteral feeding, a solution containing glucose, amino acids, lipids, vitamins, all the essential nutrients are provided. So the patient can actually continue metabolizing, it will get the appropriate nutrients, but we are bypassing the gastrointestinal tract. As opposed to parenteral feeding, we have enteral feeding, in which the nutrients are administered directly into the stomach or the small intestine. In this case, we are not bypassing the gastrointestinal tract. Why is this a, an important clinical problem? There is a lot of people, there is a lot of patients that are fed through parenteral feeding. What happens there for? What happens to the gastrointestinal tract when it's not being used? The answer is that it atrophies. Parenteral feeding induces gastrointestinal GI atrophy and remodeling of the intestinal mucosa with a decrease in the absorption surface. And these, of course, affect the two mechanisms I was referring to earlier, cell proliferation and cell apoptosis or cell shedding. 
And we can see this in an experiment or in a study done in rats. How does this epithelia in rats change when the animals are not fed? Structural changes during fasting. And in this case, it's important to point out that this is a non-naturally fasting species because rats you, uh, tend to uh, eat continuously. What we see in these micrographies on your left-hand side, you have the control experiment in which you have a villus here, you have the enterocytes, each one of these columns is a cell. LP stands for lamina propria, it's the basal lamina on which these cells are sitting. So you have two villi here. As opposed, on the right hand side, with the situation when these rats have been fasted for 48 hours, two days. After fasting for, 20, uh, for 48 hours, there is a destruction of the intestinal tips of the villi due to increased apoptosis of the mucosa. So what's happening here is that in the tip there is increased apoptosis, there is decreased proliferation, therefore this epithelium is regressing. Notice also that the lamina propria that earlier was reaching close to the tip, now it's regressing. That's what you see down here or down here. So what you have is an atrophy associated with the lack of feeding. Reduction of mucosal cell renewal, cell migration rates also decrease from the strips of liver tumor. What we see is a shortening of the villi and a decreased jejunal mucosal max, uh, mass, but at least one half. And that's what you see in these micrographies as well. Same thing. In this case, earlier you were seeing it in cross section. What you see here now, uh, sorry, in transversal section, now you see it in cross section. You see the tube, the, the villi here, this is your control, that means the fed animal, versus the fasted animal. You see a larger degree of disorganization, fewer villi in this case. In the rat, a non-fasting species, a species that eats regularly, two days of fasting induce important changes, important atrophy in the gastrointestinal tract. But of course, if we think in terms of animals in the wild, there are numerous species that actually feed less regularly. You have examples here, the alternance of anorexic and hyperphagic periods in many species. Anorexic periods, they are, the animals are not eating. Hyperphagic periods in which the animals are eating more than needed. Penguins do not eat fast when on land, and instead they are hyperphagic, they are eating at sea. Not only that, in penguins, for example, you have situations with a shortage of food. When does that happen? In the emperor penguin, emperor penguins that incubate the eggs in the Antarctic winter for a period of four months, the animals are not eating during this period. So you have actually many different penguin species. Some, the smallest species of the penguins, actually have fasts, fast or stop eating for short periods of time, one to three days. These periods are longer in the middle penguins, up to two weeks, and they are longest in the largest of the penguins, the emperor and also the king penguin. So it's important to notice that fasting is a natural it's a natural response in many species because actually they, that's the way that they used to live or they are used to. Mm -hmm. So the point comes, why should we study this? Why is this relevant? And here I want to bring up the figure of August Krog. August Krog is, uh, was a Danish physiologist, won the Nobel Prize in the first half of the uh, 20th century for the discovery, actually, of the, of the capillar, capillar, is capillar net, networks. And, but, in this case, I'm bringing up August Krog for his famous dictum, in which he was actually emphasizing that 
it is possible to find the species. It is possible to find the species that is naturally suited to study a particular problem. For such a large number of problems, there will be some animal of choice or a few such animals on which it can be most conveniently studied. Parenteral feeding is a clinical problem. It's a clinical problem because it results in gut atrophy. But there we have many animal species, the penguins would be one of them, in which this is not a problem. Fasting actually can actually occur for a much longer period of time. Can we, by studying penguins, learn something relevant that can have a clinical application? This is where Crocs Dick 2 comes in. There's an example here in which uh, this is actually dictate, dictated or written by August Croc himself, in which he's referring to Christian Bohr. Christian Bohr was actually the son of Niels Bohr, the well-known physicist. Uh, what Christian Bohr was studied, the it was studied in, uh, or it was interested in studying the respiratory mechanisms of the lungs. And in this case, he realized that there was a, a particular species of a tortoise, land turtle, in which the trachea divides into the two main bronchi high up in the neck. That allowed him to actually study, study the both lungs separately, the mechanics of both lungs separately by actually exposing these two different phenomena. This is one example that Croc brings, brings along in which particular animal species may be suitable to study a given physiological problem. And the point that I'm trying to make in this lecture is that by studying penguins, we can also gain a proper understanding of the mechanisms by which the gastrointestinal tract adjusts to changes in feed intake. And this is an important aspect because in, uh, as you will see in next lectures, when we deal with other species, like snakes, ambushed predators like the snakes, for which actually some theories have been formulated as to how they are able to fast for such long periods of time. But this will be the topic of a, of a subsequent lecture that you can also follow on, uh, on the YouTube channel. When we look at fasting, now we are interested in studying fasting, essentially this period in the literature is critically defined at least by two phases. For the sake of uh, being pedagogical, I have actually divided this in four phases. Phase, num phase zero is what I call the pre-fasting phase. This is not a, a phase in which the animals are fasting, but it's important to understand what the animal is going to be able to do after that. And in this case, this would be characterized by stocking up on fat, and proteins as reservoir. This is the period in which the animal is actually building up, is storing for the future. Mm -hmm. If we take emperor penguins as an example, male emperor penguins in particular, fat makes up 30, for, makes up for 30 percent of the body mass at the beginning of incubation. So before the animal starts incubating for this long winter, for four months, 30 percent of the body mass has been uh, converted into fat. In this case, glycogen contribution is totally insignificant. So it's mostly stocking up on fat that is relevant. This is followed by phase one, which is a, 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 pro, a poorly studied phase, I would say. It's a, stage, a phase in which is, there's a rapid adaptation, in which the animal starts losing weight slowly and actually starts mobilizing fat. This is a phase that is actually very short. In penguins, it's considered as the phase from when the animal stops feeding at sea and the animal is returning to land at the same time. It's a phase poorly studied in penguins because that's the time that the animals are transitioning between sea to land. And then the most important phase, phase two, is the economy phase, is the phase in which the animal starts metabolizing what the animal has stored. Most of the energy during this period is derived from lipids. Mm -hmm. 
This phase is accompanied, is followed also by a reduction in metabolic rate in emperor penguins, by a reduction by 30 to 40 percent in metabolic rate. So the animal is not only mobilizing fat, but slows down metabolically, is using less energy than it used to be. This phase in penguins can last up to 52 days instead of 48 hours, as we saw in the rats. And that's where Croak's dictum applies. Here we have a much larger time window looking at what is going on, what is happening. And phase three is followed, obviously, by fa uh, phase two is followed, obviously, by phase three. In, and, and that's characterized by muscle breakdown. You may imagine that by the time that fat is running low, other things have to be burnt, and in this case is protein, it's the muscle. And then we are reaching the level towards the animal will be able to withstand this fasting. Mm -hmm. There is an increased rate of body mass loss, there is protein utilization, although fat stores are not completely exhausted, there is much less fat. And these are the four phases I'm going to show up on some studies in penguins illustrating the different changes, the different metabolic changes that can be observed in these animals. Mm -hmm. In penguins, as I said, incubation not only, because notice that the molting, molting is the period where the penguins exchange their feathers. Because of that, they are also bound to land. They cannot uh, go into the water. It would be too cold. So molting or incubation actually are the periods in the lifetime of a penguin when these animals will be fasting. And what you see here is what happens to protein and lipid masses in the animal as they switch between phase three, phase two to phase three. As I told you, during phase two, rapid or the utilization of lipids, when not all the lipids are exhausted, but there is much fewer of them, that slows down, and that's when phase three kicks in, from a relatively slow utilization of protein to a much faster utilization of protein, signifying, well, this is close to the very end. We can now look at many different types of metabolites, and this is one of them. These are ketone bodies. Fatty acids and ketone bodies will have to increase during phase two, and this is what you see here. A progressive increase during phase two, and by phase three it starts decreasing again. What this means is that this is showing actually the utilization of fat as the main source of energy, at least during phase two. During phase three, this decreases because obviously what's happening now is going to be the use of amino acids or the use of protein. And that's what you see here. Essentially, the concentration of alanine, one of the one, one amino acid in the blood, increases, it's stabilized during phase two and progressively increases during phase three, signifying that proteins are broken down and proteins or amino acids are made available in the circulation. This is contrasting what, with what happens to the nitrogenous waste products, urea and uric acid. Again, during phase two, they are relatively level. By phase three, when protein breakdown takes place, more nitrogenous waste has to be uh, eliminated, and that's what's seen by the dramatic increase in urea concentration, but also uric acid. Clearly indicating protein catabolism during phase three. During phase three, what's happening with this protein? Protein is broken down into amino acids, and the key is that amino acids, not all of them, but many amino acids, can enter <coughs> glycolysis through the process of gluconeogenesis. Formation of sugars, pyruvate in particular, that can actually lead to transformation of so proteins are being broken down because there are no carbohydrates are available, there is the lipid, uh, relatively few lipids, and then it's amino acids that are used for that purpose. I want to emphasize that this is a terminal phase. This is a non-desired element. Expe the expectation is that most animals in fasting natural states, wild animals that are fasting, will never reach phase three and will stay within phase two. That's the phase in which they are capable of accounting energetically by using the stored energy they have.
the detail here is that when too much protein is lost, the situation becomes lethal. 50% protein loss is regarded as a lethal situation. Other indicators of this situation, corticosterone. Corticosterone, which is also regarded as a stress hormone, increases dramatically during phase 3. The same happens with aldosterone. Both are steroids. And actually, to the point that this probably could be used as the main indicator for the transition between phase 2 to phase 3, the elevation of corticosterone levels, mm -hmm. Pro which promote further protein breakdown and gluconeogenesis. Mm -hmm. I think that this is just basically the same picture. This is basically the same picture of, of the, the changes that we've seen that would summarize these fasting phases in penguins, mm, animals that will naturally fast. Fasting, highly dependent on the ability to store. This is the phase zero, I call it, the storage phase. Length of the phase two, long, particularly long in naturally fasting species like penguins, much shorter in regular feeding, uh, in regular feeders like rats or even ourselves, humans. In During phase 2, glucose comes through gluconeogenesis at a much lower rate, but protein breakdown during phase 3 becomes critical, and this is where the urea levels increase, corticosterone levels increase, and this is a pathological situation, muscle wasting, that leads to a, an emergency situation. So, obviously, phase 3 should not be part of a natural fasting scenario. Phase 0 accumulation, phase 1 poorly characterized phase 2, the utilization of lipids. And that should be the view that we have 